Welcome to everyone, and, and we hope uh, there are enough seats. It looks like there are. We have it about figured out uh, pretty closely. And um, I'd like to welcome you all this evening. Uh, I'm Pat Bird, a member of the Palo Alto City Council. And first, I would like to um, recognize a few of the uh, people who have been able to join us and uh, the sponsors of the event as well. Uh, so this event has been co-sponsored by a whole bunch of wonderful community groups who are involved in supporting youth here in our city. And um, they are all collaborating both on this event and a whole bunch of other things uh, that are uh, going on and we hope that you'll continue to be involved with. The groups are Adolescent Counseling Services, Asian Americans for Community Involvement, Click PA, Community Advisory Committee for Special Education, Family and Children's Services of Silicon Valley, the First Congregational Church, thank you very much for sponsoring, uh, hosting us tonight, First Presbyterian Church, Grace Lutheran Church, Palo Alto Neighbors WeChat Group, Pop Padres Hispanos de Pali, Palo Alto Chinese Parents Club, Palo Alto Advocates for Student Success, Silicon Valley Women's Alliance, St. Mark's Episcopal Church, Student Equity Action Network, United for a Better Community, and We Can Do Better Palo Alto. Let's give a round of thanks for all these groups. I'd also like to just take a moment to acknowledge some um, special community leaders and elected officials who are here today and ap apologize in advance if I miss anyone. Um, so uh, first, uh, our school superintendent, Max McGee. Uh, Palo Alto Unified School District uh, uh, trustees, Melissa Baton caswell and Terry Godfrey. Uh, we have our uh, Palo Alto Mayor, Karen Holman. And uh, we have Gun Principal, Denise Herman. And then we have a, a number of people from the sponsoring groups, and there are probably more. Um, uh, first, I, I'd, I'd like to uh, introduce Rob DeGoose, who is our Director of Community Services and one of the co-founders of Project Safety Net. <laughs> Lee Erickson from Youth Community Services. Uh, let's see, and then uh, Barry Chang, who is a Cupertino Council Member, and is it Vice Mayor? Uh, Michaela Hellman Tincher, who is from the uh, County Supervisor Joe Simidian's office. <laughs> Diane Neiman. Um, is it Neiman? Yes. Um, sorry, from Family and Children's uh, Services. And <laughs> Susan Usman from the Palo Alto uh, PTA Council and Project Safety Net. And everybody else that I forgot. <laughs> so uh, just very briefly, I want to uh, say that I'm really looking forward to hearing from all the youth today, uh, both those who have been brave enough to sit up on this uh, um, stage and others who hopefully will speak out later from as we have a, a question and answer period and, and offer their comments. And we're all looking forward to hearing your perspectives about uh, uh, being youth in our community, problems that you have, ideas that you have about how uh, we can help you better, and also looking forward to sharing your insights about your friends and your peers, because often you're the best eyes and ears about their needs, and they may not be as brave about speaking up as you are. And I uh, finally just want to Becky, mention that Becky's going to talk a little bit more, but we have other events coming up, and um, the City of Palo Alto and Project Safety Net and others are co-sponsoring a forum on May, uh, March 27th. And in a way, that'll be an outgrowth of here because when we hear today 
uh, thoughts and ideas. That forum is going to start trying to move some of those into how we might actually carry them out. So thanks again to everyone. Thanks to all the audience for coming, the, most of all the kids who came, but also the parents and everybody else. And uh, now I'd like to introduce Becky Beacom from Palo Alto Medical Foundation, who's going to be the moderator today. Thanks, Becky. Thank you, Pat. Before I start, I want to make sure if there is anyone who needs translation, uh, could you please raise your hand? Way up high. One to the couple to the right. Thank you. All righty. Well, first of all, I, I am uh, the person who has the best job in the house tonight. With all these adults, I have had the privilege of meeting with the young people that you see before you on the stage, uh, a, a diverse group from Pally and Gunn, and we're going to get to hear them right away. The format of this evening is really to maximize the number of youth voices that we can possibly hear, so we are going to be moving very, very quickly. Uh, before I go too much into format, however, I would really like to set the tone and um, I'd like to bring up Charlene Liao. I'm sure I've mispronounced your name, but Charlene is going to uh, describe something for you that actually we used at the very first youth forum with the City of Palo Alto Youth Council and Youth Collaborative from 2010. And some of you who are at the back will have a hard time seeing this, but I hope you'll make time to come up and um, at the end of the evening and take a peek for yourself at this beautiful symbol. And I'm gonna let Charlene um, talk a little bit about that right now. Hi. Can you hear me? Let's see. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, so this beautiful traditional Chinese character means to listen. And it has several components which reflect the meaning of the traditional Chinese character. On the left side is a ear. So you listen with your ear. But more than that, in the middle, there, is, there are eyes, a pair of eyes. And there is a number one, which means to focus on divided attention. And at the bottom is heart. You listen attentively with undivided attention, with open heart, and with your ear. That's our expectation. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, very, very important for setting the tone tonight. And in this way, uh, for the adults and other students, and even uh, other student speakers to take this to heart, but what we're hoping tonight is that all of us will, have, will be active participants in this, even if you're silent out there, to be definitely in the moment as these young people are sharing their thoughts with you. Uh, the symbolism is strong and beautiful as it was five years ago. I'm happy that it's here tonight. There's a humility about the symbol um, in that we suspend our assumptions about what these young people are going to talk about. I actually don't really know. Um, I've had the opportunity to talk with them, but I'm going to be uh, hopefully pleasantly surprised by a wide variety of topics. I love the active aspect of listening, and all of you again are active participants tonight. And we find our common ground, whether we're adults or young people, uh, whether we are speaking or listening, um, the common ground of our hearts. Um, I also wanted to point out, because many of you saw the flyer that referred to developmental assets, and as many of you know, that's been central to the city of Palo Alto, to Project Safety Net, to our schools, and many of us. There are some wonderful uh, handouts over there about the developmental assets, but one of the, the most important assets that we scored the lowest on was how youth expressed whether they felt listened to or not. And many of us have been working on this for a number of years, but it is what brings us here tonight. I also will finish by just by saying there's a lot of momentum right now in terms of having conversations and listening to young people. Uh, most recently, last week, the school district and other partners started a community conversation. Last week at Palo Alto High School, they had their own school-specific youth forum. And 
On May, excuse me, March 20th, our third Youth Speaks Out uh, will be held at the Art Center, which is youth expressing their voices and their experiences through art, painting, drawing, written word, and performance. As you heard by uh, Councilman Pat Burt, the uh, Teen Advisory Board and Youth Council are going to be continuing a conversation and a true dialogue uh, with adults and young people on March 27th, and hopefully we'll hear from some of those representatives tonight. So that's it, really, and we're going to, the way we're going to do the format tonight, and um, I, I, will, I, I want to explain a few things. We're going to hear from our panelists, but I want to point out also some rules that we have. You, uh, we have some cards on your seats, and if you're a student, the, uh, the card that is colored, I think it's blue, if you want to say something but you're afraid to speak on a mic or be videotaped, because we are being videotaped, uh, you can write your thoughts down and an adult will represent that for you. Yeah, thank you, Sue, if you'll hold up the blue ones. And the white cards are for adults to provide feedback to the organizers or to the students, um, the speakers. Once the panel finishes, um, and we're gonna, each of these young people is gonna have about four minutes to speak, and we're gonna go systematically one by one when they're finished. If there are youth out in the audience that want to speak, there'll be some roving mics um, that will be coming to you. And the students at that point will have about two minutes. And this is, again, to try and maximize the number of people speaking. Um, let's see. That, or at least that's our plan right now is two minutes. At the end of this, all of your comments, all of the things that the students have mentioned will be um, taken down in notes and anon anonymously um, put into a report that will go forward to uh, the various leadership groups, city council, school board, faith, community, health care, whatever you guys talk about, it will get to the place where it needs to be heard. So what we have, and we're going to have you guys start pretty quickly now, um, we have 14 panelists who've been willing to speak. 12, I think, are here. We have two that are going to be coming in a little bit later, hopefully. I've met with all of you, and um, I've enjoyed your energy. Ah, hello, <laughs> wonderful. Um, I've enjoyed their energy, and it's really an honor to be with them in this role. And I want to thank you before I say anything else for agreeing to participate. Um, we've asked these young people to speak from their experience on the subject of youth well-being, the perspectives that they'd like adults to truly hear. and. Uh, they know, and this is what we talked about, is that you're in the presence of adult leaders tonight, formal and informal. Adults who shape the experience of Palo Alto youth in their homes, in their schools, and in the greater community. And you are in friendly territory. I know it's, I'm nervous too, so, uh, but you guys look calm. You're surrounded by caring adults and lots of friends out in the audience who are ready to listen actively with their heart, their mind, and undivided attention. We're here because we care. That's our common ground as listeners and speakers, and they recognize this is a real opportunity. Um, they can speak on any topic. OK. And um, we're asking them to respect others, avoid responding to each other's comments, and speaking only for themselves or for their idea or insight. And we have one brave soul who is going to start us off, and that is Jessica Luo. Did I do it right? You can repeat. And Jessica is a senior at Gunn. And Jessica, when you're finished, do you have one of Okay. When she's finished, she's, we're going to, um, I will introduce each of you as you pass the, the All right. <clears throat> this is a letter to my ninth grade self. So, you're in ninth grade. How it makes you strive for the appearance of greatness rather than for greatness itself? And what do those whispered conversations say to your friend who decided to drop down a math lane to improve her stress levels? The system awards no points for working hard on something you're not already good at. So what can we do about this? Right now, there's a major flaw in our approach. We aim our arrows at false targets. That's because it's easier to think of culture as a tumor that can be attacked to throw policy changes like block schedules and homework restrictions at the tumor in the hopes of shrinking it. But the tumor just comes back because the disease is somewhere else. 
The culture and the system are not some monster looming above Palo Alto. The system is made up of your actions and the actions of the people around you. The disease in our culture comes from all the little assumptions you take as truth when you say that you have to do an extracurricular in order to succeed, when you respect people more when they take higher lane classes. But these statements don't seem bad to you. They're just part of daily life. That's what's dangerous about culture. It's sneaky. It's the air you don't feel yourself breathing until you realize you've run out of it. So how do we fight an invisible enemy? The enemy is fought through noticing, through asking yourself, is this really true? Is this really what I think and not what culture says? Doing this is hard. When someone asks you what your hopes and dreams are, making a joke about getting into Harvard is a lot easier than admitting to yourself that you really don't know right now. Swimming against the current is never as easy as just letting it take you where you're going. But if you look downstream and see that the current isn't taking you where you want to go, swimming away is something that you have to do. Notice the air you breathe. Notice the people you're, you're helping and harming. Know that your enemy does not live in the problems that look clear cut, but in the shady assumptions beneath. Seek out the people who crusade not just with words and ideas, but who live the example whose compassion extends beyond the corrupting influence of our culture. Be like them. When you wear that orange Unity Day pin, think not about the idea of bullying prevention, but of the people who make it happen. The friends who help you laugh off insults, the teachers who've shared their stories and inspired you. Try to be one of those people for the others around you. When you hear people laugh about Not In Our Schools Week, suppress your natural inclination to think of we're all in this together as a trite cliche because that reaction isn't natural. It's the culture sneaking in again. Make the effort to see that slogan instead as a reminder to be there for the people around you when they, fail, when they fall. See beyond the common assumption that every move from the administration is an attempt to subjugate the students to their will. Don't blame them when they get things wrong. Show them how to correct their mistakes. A single decision doesn't change your direction. Your destiny and our culture are made up of the thousands of little decisions you make every day. When to speak, when to listen, when to ignore the voices that tell you ju to just follow the flow. Whether to ask someone who looks sad how they feel, whether to invite someone who's sitting alone to come eat lunch with you. Think about the times when you felt like you were falling and someone reached out and grabbed you. Think about the world that you want to live in, a culture where people can leap off the safety of the ground and try to fly, knowing that others will catch them if they fall. This is the world that, through your everyday actions, you need to make. Yourself, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. And next, I'd like to introduce Serena Wang, who's a freshman at Gunn. Thank you, Serena. Hello, all. My name is Serena Wang and I am a freshman at Gunn High School. And I have enjoyed it so far thanks to flexible and nice teachers. I have multiple learning challenges. I moved here in 2011, went to Tillman Middle School, and ended up in one of the best high schools in the area. I hope for the schools to be flexible on what their students are going through in their lives. I also hope for schools to give a much better understanding of the students that are constantly fighting their own battles either externally or internally. As Plato says, be kind. Everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle, end of quote. I chose this quote because it really helped me to change my point of view on people and their lives. As Plato states, you can see people battling for their life on the outside, but you can't see the internal battles. I have observed that some of my fellow classmates had physical battles, like medical scars on their faces or hair loss to incurable diseases. Yet with flexible schools, they continue to pursue their dreams. A lot of students are already working hard to achieve a good grade. And the teens could be very stressed out or put under academic pressure. I suggest that the schools should also recognize and accommodate the eternal scars of students. I realize that now that I'm, I am very grateful for all of the people who I met in my life, mainly because they supported my needs and paved the path to where I am now. 
I now hope for schools to broaden their flexibility and to reach into the students' hearts to understand what the students are headed to in their daily and personal lives. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. And next we have Charles Yu, who is a senior at Palo Alto High School. Okay, thanks, Becky. Um, I apologies beforehand because I don't have a, a speech prepared. <laughs> These wonderful speeches here. Uh, but so please excuse me if I do stumble or I contradict myself, which is weird. Um, but I just wanted to talk about AP classes. Um, I know not everyone is involved in these programs and they're not for everyone, um, and I respect that. But for those people who are currently involved and or um, are maybe interested in getting involved in AP classes, I just wanted to speak to these um, individuals. Um, I want to address the AP hype, and I feel like there's definitely some, uh, there's like a twofold problem here. It's that people perceive a all AP classes to be exactly the same. They're, you know, killer classes, um, the source of all stress and all, you know, all youth problems. Um, and that, you know, APs are, you know, the, the, the source of getting into college, like the surefire way to get into college. Um, but obviously that isn't true. So from my personal experience, I want to address that first point that, you know, AP classes are uh, killer. Um, I'm currently taking five AP classes and that might seem like a lot, but I assure you I do have time to, you know, fit social time in and extracurriculars into my schedule. So it's not like I'm confined to my room all day. Um, but I will say that the killer AP class like stereotype, it does exist. Um, out of my four classes, I would say one class, my BC Calc class, is probably, you know, 65% of my effort is directed towards that one class. Um, and everything else is, you know, it's like a regular class. I, I just I enjoy, enjoy taking them, um, and I don't feel like it's anything too much different. Um, but I do feel like when people say that they struggle with AP classes, it's not really that they're struggling with APs necessarily, but they're struggling with the subject that, that AP is in. If you're always struggling in math, of course, AP BC is going to be hard for you, from my experience. Um, and if you're struggling with chem, then obviously AP chem is going to be difficult for you. So I feel like there definitely is um, a pressure for kids to take classes that are APs, um, even though you know they might not necessarily want to. Um, and, and that brings me to my next issue, that parents and kids have this misconception that taking APs boosts their chances of getting to colleges. Um, and many of them are giving up you know, extracurriculars and times that they could be using to dedicate you know, to other classes that they might be interested in taking uh, for APs. But from my own experiences, those who really care and who are really passionate about um, the things they do, the extra clues they get involved in, the classes they take, rather than just you know blindly taking APs, those are the kids who get into the colleges they want. Um, so, um, especially people who uh, are, uh, sorry, <laughs> this is my stumble. Um, yeah, if you're, if you're a responsible person with APs, and you're taking them not just for the credit, because colleges won't see um, someone who's taking a lot of APs as you know a, a candidate. They can't find your passions through you know your AP scores or the classes you're taking. It's more about what things you get involved in and what extracurriculars and what things you push yourself out to do. So those are just my, my points. Thank, Thank you. you, Charles. And next we have Mark Harris and. Mark is a junior at Gun. Hello. Yeah, like like you said, I'm a junior at Gun. My name is Merrick Mark Harris. Um, so basically, I just wanted to talk about my experiences at Gun so far, and basically just like the entire Gun culture. So I've been at Gun all my high school, and in my experience, I found that it's very loving and like open-minded, and just great community. And sure, it is academically rigorous and it's hard for a lot of students and it's easy for a lot of students but I feel like there's that balance that anyone can reach if they know what classes they're going to take and I haven't met like any teacher or staff or student that's really like out to get me or mean or just a terrible person because everyone just is pretty nice like the teachers they're easy to talk to if you have any problems the staff are always there just if you have any issues. So for me, the problem when we have like the events that passed, it's just everyone seems to want to blame 
like one specific thing. And with issues like that, we don't have like a definite cause for it, something that we can really take care of. I believe that the issue with gun is with the atmosphere. So when school when students enter gun, it seems like they have this preconceived idea that they have to do well. And I think that's the root of all the problems. And that's ultimately an atmosphere. And we can't solve that by blaming the teachers or getting less homework or anything like that. So for me, I think the best solution would just be redistributing the gun and paddling divisions for the students. And that was proposed a couple years ago when the first like events happened. But I think that if you took all the students and just mixed them up, it would create this new atmosphere that would just help students learn better and get new ideas and destroy these preconceptions that they have just entering high school. Like for me, in my experience, if I, for instance, if I were to take a, like a low lane class, none of my friends or the teachers would say anything bad about it. If I got a bad on a grade on a test, no one would make fun of me. But yet, I would still feel bad about getting that bad grade or being in that low class. And that's not anyone's fault. So I think the issue is that we need to bring, I need to help the students' intrinsic motivation, I guess, so that they have this idea that they are good despite what everyone else said. Or even like with what everyone else says, they need to have, they need to believe in themselves more so. And I think that's the issue that we have to resolve. So that's one thing. And another thing is, I just wanted to like kind of have a shout out to all my teachers again because I've had great teachers and everyone's been great and like even with recent events I've seen that the teachers they're just they care and what I find is when people blame the teachers it's just it's kind of like heartbreaking because the teachers they care about the students and they want the best for the students and when stuff like ha stuff that's happened happens, they feel bad and they take it on themselves personally. But I want like them to know that it's not their fault. And I think we should take a step aside and like realize that it's not their fault. And we should stop blaming them for the issue at hand and we should learn for a more global and future solution to the issue instead of trying to find something finite that we can fix currently because this is definitely not a current problem that we can definitely fix right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have Cezanne Lane and Cezanne is a sophomore at Palo Alto High School. Thank you, Becky. Hi, I'm Cezanne. Um, I'd first like to thank everyone who has helped to make this happen and thank you all for giving me an opportunity. Uh, to share my experiences um, as a student at Palo Alto High School. So I'm gonna use my computer for notes uh, because I didn't really have time to go home and print them because I've been in Arinda all weekend, which would also explain my wonderful attire for this occasion. I was at a race, so I'm sorry. Um, so I, I'm gonna start with the, okay, I used to love school. Uh, I loved math and science and English and history and art and recess, of course, <laughs> all of the above. <laughs> and while I may not be the most accurate sample, I do hope that other kids would agree with me. But recently I've begun questioning what has changed. Why have I gone from ecstatic and curious to tired and worn out? Granted, third grade and 10th grade are rather different, <laughs> but I think there is more that has changed. School has become less and less about learning and exploring the world for me and all of its greatness and more and more about the amount of APs that you're planning on taking next year and uh, what will look good when applying to colleges and your exact test average compared to the guy next to you. If you walk around Pali during finals week, you can feel the stress radiating off of people. Uh, even if you weren't already stressed, it's practically contagious. People are high strung and snappy. If I were to sum up finals week in one phrase, I would say mental breakdowns. And the scary thing is, I'm pretty sure this is normal. I swear it's not just me. Um, at a forum that I recently attended, earlier this week actually, a girl brought up finals and she said that she had never heard of anyone who 
finals had helped, who, who had benefited from finals. Ideally, I think that finals should be optional and should only improve your grade. If I earned and maintained an A in a class for over four months, I don't think that two hour, a two hour test and one and a half weeks of studying should take away the validity of my A. Keeping in mind that finals deciphering grades is not the case uh, for just one class, but for five or six other classes as well. In addition, the week before finals, I was still learning new material, and I think that's ridiculous. So not only am I being told to remember everything that I've learned for the past four months, I'm also learning new material that eventually I should be memorizing for a two-hour test. <laughs> In the end, finals should not decipher whether or not you have a 3.3 or a 3.9. I'd say the most I've gotten out of finals week is impe impeccable memorization skills and learning how to perform, perform with less than five hours of sleep. And the best part, three months later, I have no idea what I was tested on. <laughs> this brings me to my next point. Recently, someone introduced me to the concept of doing school. In other words, playing the system. And I've realized how frighteningly relevant that is for me and for many people I know at Pali. Instead of learning material and absorbing it and really experiencing what learning should be about, I feel like people are learning how to do word searches in textbooks so that they can finish their questions as fast as they can because, oh man, I have a whole other worksheet and 10 hours of reading. Um, and I think that's become a really big problem where, and I think that may be why I don't love school anymore, because instead of, <laughs> instead of learning, I'm doing school. Um, some ideas I have, I don't know if I have time for them. Uh, mandatory worksheets that are repetitive, instead of it being about completion, it should be about understanding the concept. Um, the math department at Pali recently introduced that into some lanes, and so instead of doing the same type of problem 30 times, you could do it twice, know that you got it, and you got a short quiz on it the next day. And that meant instead of doing an hour of homework, I was able to complete it, and I still understood the material. And I think that was really good. Um, in addition, math laning graded. Um, so in sixth grade, you, your math lane is deciphered on a scale from like one to seven, I think. And it's pretty much your sixth grade teacher saying, this is how you're going to be for the next six years. Um, and so as a 11 year old, you're told your abilities as a 16 year old in mathematics. And I think that's ridiculous. And I think it should be taken away because there are kids now in high schools calling themselves stupid because their sixth grade teacher told them they weren't good at math. And the lower lanes are literally called the stupid math. I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, they were reacting to some timekeeping, which all of you, right there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Suzanne. And now we have Malcolm Jones. And Malcolm is a, a senior at Gunn High School. Thanks, Malcolm. Hi, my name is Malcolm. Thank you, Becky. Um, I wanted to talk about something a little bit lighter tonight. So thank you for everyone who's come out. Yes, there's this big focus on the negative aspects to our city, to our culture, to our schools. But there's a totally other side that we can attack, and that's happiness. If we can, if we can shift our culture from negativity and academics to just focusing on happiness. It's a little bit crazy, but at the end of the day, happiness can fix a lot of things. Encourage study breaks. Encourage kids to go on hikes encourage teachers not to give homework for the weekend so that weekend is actually a break and not an extra 48 hours for homework. There's a lot of things that can change and I think that student stress, their entire like academic pressures and their friends and just the environment of the schools can change and everybody looks at things in a much different way. I'm someone who's found that it's much easier to get my work done if I'm, for example, sitting in a park. That is a lot easier for me to do. It reduces my stress, and it makes school more, more doable the next day. Um, that's all, but at the end of the day, a little love can go a long way. Thank you.
Okay, we're going to go to the right side of the room. And Tiffany, Tiffany Fields is a senior at Palo Alto High School. She's way up there. Here we go, Tiffany. Hopefully this is on and working. Hello? Yeah? Can you hear me? Is it working? Yeah, it's working. All right. Um, hi, my name is Tiffany. Um, I'm a senior at Palo Alto High School. Um, this year I am involved in student government. I'm the multicultural commissioner. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how I feel like it's going to be, it, this, is, this year it's specifically it's a very difficult year to fill the shoes of no, not in our schools week. Um, because of the recent events that's happened, it's so much, it's really important that we um, really like make our school an inclusive place and um, that we really just like love on each other and it's really hard to proctor an event toward in 45 minutes for one week to get everyone to love each other and say like yeah like we can all do this school is fun let's make school fun let's not judge each other on what math lane we're in or science lane all that stuff and it's it's really sad that our school, like that we have to put so much pressure on just one week in our entire like school, in, in, one, in one year, in one whole entire year. It's really sad that we have to put that into one week to say, oh, yeah, like, let's all hug and be friends. But we haven't focused on that at all in the entire year. And then we expect one person to put it all in one day, uh, in one week. And, um, I just, like, I hope that in future years, like, we can start this in like, our middle schools and elementary schools, where we get this idea of, from our teachers, like, let's all respect each other. Let's take up five minutes in class, like, beginning of class, and just check in, like, see how everyone's doing. Because a lot of times, teachers can, like, get upset at how a student is acting, or they assume that because a student doesn't do their homework, or, Something like that, that they're like, they don't care about school. It could just be something that's going on wrong at home. And they just haven't had a time to, to talk about it. No one's asked them about how their day's going. And I feel like if we, in, in our elementary schools, if we just start to begin to say, how was your day, guys? Like, how was your weekend? Same thing in middle school. In high school, well, it'll already be put in our, like, our mindset. And it'll just make everyone closer just by doing that one thing. Because I know that. It makes a tremendous difference when I go into a classroom and a teacher is like, on a Monday, when I'm really tired and I just live hours with the homework on Sunday and I just got off of work and I'm exhausted. And then the teacher says, how was your weekend? What'd you guys do? It just, I, I don't know, it, it makes it a lot better to just go through that um, moment in time. That was my first little thing I was gonna talk about. And then I also wanted to talk about um, how I am from East Palo Alto and I'm on the voluntary transfer program, and um, how a lot of people form judgments in their heads about um, the VTP program and how it's not a good program and people just come, like students just come over here to take our resources and we're not benefiting from them. And I'm here to say that I've, I've benefited from it so much. Like the way, like I would have never got the academics that I like, I'm not sure how to like say this, but like it made me grow as a person and I know how to kind of like code switch, you know, kind of go like back forth and like, like with my family, like I know how to act and then when it's time to like be serious and have conversations, like I've learned to do that. Like in job interviews, it's easy for me because I know how to have conversation with people and not to say that I wouldn't have learned that in other school districts, but Palo Alto just made it so much easier for me and um, like I'm going to go to a four-year college, and a lot of people assume that I'm not. Like when I'm with my friends, oh, are you going to go to a two-year? Are you going to go to a junior college? Like what college are you going to go to? And it's kind of sad, you know. And um, it might just be all in my head, but I feel like people put judgments on other people because of where they come from, and. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Tiffany, I think that was somebody else's timer, but that's fine. Oh. And Advait Aran, am I pronouncing this correct? Yeah. Advait Aran, who's a uh, 
freshman at in high school, who was one of our late uh, entries who got here right on time, and I, I'm so happy that you're here. Yeah, sorry for being late, but uh, thanks for letting me speak anyway. Uh, Tiffany, uh, thank you for taking at least half of what I was going to say and putting it in better words. Um, like, you took half of my speech, which I planned only five minutes ago, and you, you just said it all. Uh, thank you. Um, so I can say for a fact that high school is not what I thought it was going to be. It's not what I signed up for. It, it was, it's so much better and so much more interesting than you would think. Um, after what's gone on this year, I mean, the good things and the bad. Like, I, I love high school. I love gun high. I love the people. I, I think it's great. But then, at the same time, I don't like some of the attitudes that some people have towards um, the environment, or like here at school. Um, like, echoing others' others' thoughts here, people look for someone else, something, someone else to blame, and I think a lot of people are just take the time to blame. Oh, it's the homework load. Oh, it's the academic stress. Oh, it's starting school at 8:25 a.m. Um, I don't think so. I think it's. I, I like the school system, I like how it works. I really don't think any of that needs change. Well, except for block schedule, I think that would be nice. Um, I, I, sorry, I'm stumbling again because my speech was made only five minutes ago. Um, so, I mean, I'm also quoting someone else's phrase here, but school is not the problem, it just might be a problem. Um, I think, like Tiffany was saying, with not in our schools week, we have a lot of that. Um, asking how is your day, how is your weekend, how is your day in class is actually a wonderful idea. Um, but sometimes the problems that people face, they might not be in school. So, not in our schools day should really be a not in our community where attitudes and um, feelings toward certain things can change. Um, there's there's tons of pressure all around. I can feel it. When you say, oh, I'm going to sign up for Geo Honors. Oh, is that, that sounds tough. And I say, well, yeah, it is, but I want to. There are people who say that, and there are people who say, oh, just my parents who are making me sign up for me. I know people who are on both sides of that. Um, where am I going with this? Okay. Um, so everyone has a different attitude, to, attitude toward this problem, and I feel it's not a bad thing, but I think all of us, um, also, echoing you, I forget your name, I'm sorry, but just take a happier look. Take a happier look at our community. Think of what an awesome community we have. All of us here have the potential to actually change um, all the negative thoughts, negative attitudes. We have the potential to actually do things, make things right. I mean, from, from, the, from the start, we... I'm sorry, what, where, where am I saying? Um, so we, as a community, we have the potential to change a lot of the things that are wrong with the system and make good the things that are right with the system. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. <laughs> and next, I'd like to introduce Lynette Sue, who is a sophomore at Penn High School. Um, hi, guys. So thank you all for coming out today. Um, so just want to talk about my experiences as a student and as an athlete at Gunn and in light of recent events, like what was going on. So um, after the recent event in back in the fall, um, at one of the games, many of us and many of the varsity players decided to play, to decided to wear patches in memory of Cameron. Um, during the game, many, uh, I overheard one of the parents talking just amongst themselves, how they thought that maybe the patches were a bit too excessive, thinking since it was already 10 days after the event that it kind of was a bit excessive. And out of the respect of the players and the students attending the game, um, none of the parents openly discussed this with the team members. And I understand that the parents would choose not to do that since it was something to commemorate a student and a friend. Um, I think though that it should have been openly discussed with the students and with the players because we all of us haven't really encountered an event like this before and we just and I think it would have been good if the parents maybe just showed more of their support and their love and maybe give a bit more guideline as to how we should have gone about the events 
and it would have been nice to know maybe just their support and or what we should and what actions we should take so that it wasn't a way to kind of like glorify it, but I just kind of glorifying it, I guess. And um, I think also because just online as well, like many, many students um, changed their profile pictures to support. And I think that was good, but after a while, like it may have gotten a bit too long. And like even now, many people still haven't changed it back. And it kind of brings attention to it every time you see your friend online or things like that. And I know it's trying to show support, but at the same time, it's kind of a way of like, not glorifying it, but bring attention in, bring attention to it. And I think it's just that maybe the parents should just give more support and give a general guideline as to how we should go about the events that occur. And I mean, I hope an event like this wouldn't ever occur again, but if it does, that we have a support system and a way to go about it. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Kevin Liu, who is a junior at Pali. Uh, hi guys, I'm Kevin from uh, Palo Alto High School, and I'm a junior. Today I'm gonna talk about my life at Pali. In 2011, my family moved to America, and I went to a private school in the Bay. And freshman year, I came to Pali. I don't know anyone, and it's all around random, uh, strange faces. So, what I like about Pali is there is a great advisory class, and I saw Mr. Boom here. Thank you, Mr. Boom, for giving me the advisory, and which is a uh, like a group of uh, other district kids who are new to the Pali district. I really like that because uh, they provide me. Uh, all the information about schools, all the activities. Also, I made a lot of friends. Second thing I'm pretty sure about Paul also is I joined the varsity football team. I really find my family there. Like they all like my brothers. Uh, we fight. Even though this year our record is pretty bad, three seven. <laughs> so it gave a lot of effort. And I sorry about that. <laughs> We try, we try. <laughs> they're, just, they're just too big, you know, like. <laughs> and I just help, like, everyone my my school helped me to be, like, adapt to this environment. And I know the last couple um, months, people might talk about bad stuff about Paul also. What I be believe is, uh, we because we, we, I know all the staff, uh, all the district, um, they're trying to help us. They're working hard, but we can't see it because we can't see the change in the short term. So I think let's work hard and silent and let success make all the noise. Thank you. Oh. And last but not least, poor Roberto. <laughs> last one. This is Roberto Rivera. He's a freshman at Pali. Thank you, Roberto. So I'm Roberto, and uh, I'm gonna do a speech about like uh, the social life in high school and stuff. So, yeah. so I'm gonna start. Um, so we all know that school provides many stressors, and as students, we are not just dealing with academic stress and grade pressures, but we also have to deal with social and emotional stress, all of which. I think we should um, address, like, as teachers, parents, and the whole community. Um, so I want to dedicate my talk on the social environment of high school and how lots of people, well, not lots of people, but some people can, like, struggle in that aspect. So, um, because, like, uh, before someone enters high school, like most people have their like groups of friends and they're already formed and stuff. So there's like a few people that haven't already made friends because they might be new to the, to the high school or like something like that. And so you'll see them like hanging out or eating by themselves and they try to get attention from others in some sort of way. 
like, um, you have to do really weird stuff, like uh, juggling tennis balls and stuff like that. And I think that that's kind of um, a mess up in the system, because I don't think that like the people that don't have friends have to like juggle tennis balls around the like lunch tables just to make friends. So I think that's a problem. And uh, so I have a story. So uh, the other day, I walked through the 800s building at Pali with a couple of friends. After arriving early from lunch at Town & Country, I saw one of my peers that I've known since middle school. He's a normal guy, and I got the chance to share a tent with him and a friend on a school field trip to Yosemite. Um, he's a cool and like funny guy, and he likes lots of average guy stuff, like video games or like pizza. <laughs> and and, and uh, that day, when I walked through the 800th building, I saw that he was eating by himself. And I was kind of shocked because um, I was like wondering how he had no one to eat with because he was a normal guy and I think I'm a normal guy and I have pretty close friends. So then I was thinking, why shouldn't he have close friends? And then once he saw me, he waved like usual and said, hi Roberto. And then I responded, what's up Joe? and I continued walking with my friends. After seeing this guy lonely and sad, eating alone, we did nothing. And I have been regretting that moment ever since. I imagine now what I could have said like, would you like to join us? Or would you like some company or something? But all I did was greet him and walk away. Now the only thing I can do is if I ever see him again, like eating by himself, I'll walk up to him and ask him to join us. And I hope this talk and my experience will encourage you and your buddies to be friends with students like Joe. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, it was fun for me to hear all that you guys had to say a lot about school. Um, a lot about wanting to be included and uh, in the conversations when decisions are coming down. Um, and I won't summarize too much because I know we have, uh, I'd like to know how many students do we have in the audience who are also willing to speak? Okay. Okay, we have, uh, well, Sue, do you want to help with that? Uh, yes, on. And um, we're going to ask before you start a um, couple of things. First of all, thank you to all of our seated panelists and then a big welcome to others out there. And, and we are moving quickly, so and again, I just, for those of you who might have come in late, I just want to make sure that you understand that what we're trying to do is maximize as many students speaking as possible. We're asking the students in the audience to um, follow the same guidelines, to try not to react to any of the other speakers, even though you might have been inspired and um, stimulated by what they had to say. And uh, so asking you to be constructive and keeping it to two minutes. So Michelle, are you going to be timing the two minutes or? OK, so will we hear that little bell when? OK, you're going to hear a little bell. So if you wouldn't mind uh, introducing yourself, telling us what school you go to, your name, your school, and what grade you're in. And thank you for saying yes to participating. Hello, uh, my name is Eric Gentile, and I'm an 18-year-old who attends Los Altos High School at Freestyle Academy. In August of last year, I checked into the hospital for suicidal thoughts. Allow me to tell you what led me to, the, to that point. I was diagnosed with depression at the age of eight, but with appropriate medication, the symptoms were subdued. But as I entered my teen years, I began experiencing mood swings, ranging from irritation to feeling melancholy, blue, and suicidal. In my angry state, I would hit walls when I was alone to get out pent-up frustration. In my depressed state, I would ask myself if life's pain had been worthwhile, with the notable answer being no. Fortunately, I gained, in my life through the, uh, gained support in my life through the friends I was making. With my parents' unending love and friend support, I was able to keep going in my angry and depressed state. Then in August of last year, I reached my breaking point when I could no longer maintain momentum. 
I came closer than ever to acting on my suicidal thoughts. I checked into the hospital where I was diagnosed with unspecified mood swings and put on a different medication. Why am I telling you this? What is the purpose of me sharing my story with you? The purpose is to illustrate that, although I'm here with you today, I do not think that would be the case if I hadn't received the proper medical care and treatment. My friends and family's continued involvement throughout my hospitalization and since then also gave me a reason to keep going. Mine is just one story among multitudes, whether they be successes or failures, which is why the suicides of many of Gun High School's students saddens me. I know the pain that those students felt, and I'm angry that our community has stood by for too long while more students have died. This wave of students who are experiencing depression cannot be treated simply with school rules and community guidelines. This wave of depression needs to be treated as a medical emergency. Those who experience suicidal thoughts need to be treated for a mental health disease by medical experts. I cannot claim that I have the solution for depression as, a disease, as it is a disease which people carry with them for the rest of their lives. One thing I can propose that has worked for me is a free and anonymous support group for young adults with, with depression. I go to such a support group in San Francisco for my depression, even though it takes me at least four and a half hours out of my day every time I go. I feel I have been able to open up and share my experiences with the group. If there was a young adult support group closer to this area, then I believe some of the suicidal students would reach out for help. It would be my dream that no one should have to carry the burden that I bear every day by living with depression. However, this will never happen. What is achievable is that those with depression can be heard. Please do not silence those who need help. We must learn from the past tragedies and, tragedies and act so they are not repeated. Thank you. and I'm a sophomore at Gunn, and um, I would like to say that there's a lot of stigma around mental illness at Gunn and in the Palo Alto community in general. As somebody who goes to a, what they call a stressful school, um, I think people think that um, having stress from your five or six APs is very normal. So not a lot of people see beyond that and see the deeper problems that our students have such as depression, um, grief problems, and other things. And a lot of our voices are suppressed, and we do not think that we are heard. Um, so I've been working with the city of Palo Alto and um, getting involved in running another forum on March 27th. And um, students like me, like them, and like all the other students, will be able to voice our own opinions and. Um, get more of our deeper ideas and thoughts out, whether that's about depression, about stress, about mental health, or about like business in Palo Alto. Um, so another thing is that we want the decision and policy makers to bring reform to what students are saying and follow up. Because um, we can talk all we want, but um, it's not, not necessarily the board or the city council will follow up and <coughs> take what we said into account and make change out of it. So we want the community as a whole to change our outlook and become a more positive and more loving community. Thank you. I'm Alex, and I'm a senior at Pali. And the first thing I want to talk about is the suicide death. People oftentimes don't like to reference them, and they'll say these events that happened. And I think that that's a mistake, that it needs to be addressed instead of pushed away. And that everyone also says that nothing can happen now, that it has to take time. And it's been nearly 15 years of suicides, and nothing's happened. So. I think that's another thing is that saying it will happen but it needs to take time isn't working and that we need to address it now. And then a second thing is that there are good teachers, there are bad teachers, and then a majority of teachers are neutral. And 
neutral teachers, people think, oh, they're neutral, they're fine, but for people with special needs, neutral teachers aren't necessarily good. They can be negative in a lot of ways because if you have a problem and they're just neutral and they're like, eh, and that doesn't really work for people with special needs. And so a lot of the neutral teachers then become negative and then there's lots of problems with that. And the special ed department is not very great. I've had lots of problems with the special ed department. And I think that the school needs to look at better counseling services. That I've had lots of problems with counseling services whether it be counselors that don't do anything or counselors that don't follow through on privacy, that they will report everything that is said, even though it's supposed to be confidential. And something following on that is that a lot of times students and the parents are not given proper information on what you can do. And thing, people are told things that need to happen a certain way, when in reality, there's not really a rule like that. And I think that's a really big problem, that mm -hmm. everyone, like, people need to take seven classes in freshman year, for example, isn't necessarily true. And a lot of that pressure around those rules that aren't actually rules. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Do we have any other student speakers or cards that have been brought through? We do have a card that you'd like to have read. You would like to read it, okay? And we have two minutes. And a, and a mic is coming to you. And, and please keep the, um, the student's name anonymous. Thank you. Um, I had to read this card because this little girl used to be very brave and she, one time she decided that she's going to stand up and she's going to speak up to the board members, but she was shut up. They actually cut the mic on her, so now she's afraid to speak up. I hope one day she can recover and be better. And this is what she says, I think we should have less homework and more preparation before we have a test. And I feel like we should have less classes, like um, less classes of uh, physical education. For homework, I need time to study. If we have to take a test within the weeks, within the week, there should be there should be no homework from any other classes except the one that we have a test in. I play soccer and I get sore. I have to take four days of PE. That is a lot. I think we should be able to at least take two days of physical education and two uh, other two, and the other two days to do another elective or have a free period where we get to use our our phones or do our homework, etc. Thank you. Do you have someone says? Yeah. Okay. Hi. I'd like to speak for my 27-year-old daughter who attended Palo Alto school system. She did very poorly. And yes, she was also special ed. We did the best we could to celebrate her successes such as they were. She's now 27 years old. And I'm here to tell you she's doing spectacularly. And I asked her, how is it you're doing so well? She said, in high school, mommy, I was punished for what I couldn't do. In life, nobody cares about that. In the work environment, they care only about what you can do. So for those of you students who have been made to feel lesser than, you will have your day. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone ready to speak up? 
Up in front here. Um, so I kind of want to push back on what I said before. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to just clarify the rules. Uh, if you could say your name. Oh, uh, and, yeah. Um, and actually, please speak for yourself rather than about another speaker's comments. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm Albert Finn. I'm a junior at Gunn. Uh, our, like, it kind of hurts when like, people say that our community hasn't been doing much to you know, do things about the, the recent events. Um, I, I can say that, uh, well, as a board member of Palo Alto Youth Council, I think we're doing, we're trying our best to combat this um, issue, this really prevalent issue about stress and redefining success. Um, it's, I mean, like, I, I really appreciate, um, I think it was Tiffany's, uh, needs, uh, she said that um, it's, it's, uh, it's like, uh, it's, I mean, it's, well, uh, like the, not in our schools, not in our schools, we, I mean, that should be a whole school year thing. It's, it's not like a one week thing. It's, it's a school, it's a whole school year thing that we should, we should do to, to it's okay. just really. That's all right. You just take a breath and we're listening. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've lost two friends already, and it, uh, the, the things that people said, um, it's really important, important to, you know, carry on, uh, carry on uh, our, uh, you know, our support throughout the whole year, yeah, instead of just a one-week thing. That's, that's like, kind of the main issue here. Um, thank you. Thank you. Nicole. <laughs> Getting your steps in. <laughs> I'm Nicole. I'm a sophomore at Pali. I think it's really great that we're holding this forum to be able to listen to people talk. And I agree with a lot of what has been said. I think, so I recently, I opened conversation with my mom about a lot of things that were never addressed before, such as race, achievement, and just opening, opening our concern for more people. And I think that that's something that every parent in Palo Alto can do, is open conversation with their kids about suicide, about, about learning instead of getting grades, and just about academic stress and about racial issues that I think are really important. So I definitely think that this is a great step and it could definitely, definitely be carried on in everyone's lives. Thank you. students wanting to add their voice? Any other cards? Okay. Well, then we may have, um, Michelle, we may have, and other organizers may have some time to have some, a little bit of uh, reaction and um, discussion, or just um, in the spirit of the beautiful symbol that Charlene uh, introduced us to, the idea of active listening and, um, oh, excuse me. Okay, we have some cards that came forward. Even though we hadn't planned for that, the cards, um, some of them were meant to go to students. Um, is that correct? That people were writing to. Um, I just wanted to say thanks, and I also wanted to ask 
the audience if this has been challenging to sit silent while you hear all these different perspectives? Not at all. Okay, good. But then that tells me that you are fully um, attent attentive to these guys. And um, I just wonder if any of you um, who participated in the panel want to talk at all about your experience um, in terms of sharing with all these adults. Tiffany, did you want to say something? Oh, good. Then we'll, then we'll go back and forth a little bit. Thanks. Um, for me, at first, um, when I first received the email, I was like, oh yeah, I'll do it. Um, I'm a pretty like nervous person. Like, I can do things, but I get really nervous Like once it starts to happen, and then I'll start talking fast or whatever. And um, the only reason why, like, for me, like, I chose to talk was because like, I know that if I don't, like nobody else will. Like you guys like won't hear like the voice of like so many like people that like I have discussions with like in Black Scholars United, like what we talk about and like what we talk about in class just with, amongst like each other. And um, I just thought it was really important to like try and get that across. Like I kind of got lost in my words, so um, a lot of the things probably didn't make that much sense, but um, I tried. So. Thank you. Beautiful job. So um, thank you guys all for coming here. When I received the email, I said, yeah, why not? Let's do it. Because, I mean, I wouldn't mind speaking to you guys. I thought I might actually say something useful. Um, then again, I wasn't able to write a speech because I thought I might not be able to come because I had rehearsal for Anything Goes, the gun, yeah. gun production. Shameless plug. <laughs> so um, I just... Then I found out rehearsal was ending early, so I wrote this piece of paper down in the car and tried to uh, you know, create something that would be worth saying. <laughs> then again, I'm also one of those speakers who can't exactly improvise something you ha I haven't memorized very well. So I missed quite a lot of thoughts, but I think a lot of these speakers here echoed what I wanted to say. And thank you guys for that. Thank you guys for being such a receptive audience. I feel that um, all of you guys will do something about it. I would love to have you guys do something about it. I think. I think you'll do what you know what the community needs and more. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. I'm gonna go over here, but I just wanted to share something when I was preparing with these young people. I asked them, all of them, what was their confidence that adults would listen, even though we had no idea what anyone was going to speak about. And I would say maybe with the exception of a one or two, they all had a lot of confidence in the community. And that was really heartwarming for me. And um, so, and I also asked them how they would feel if they've been heard. So um, maybe as some of you address the earlier question, if you want to address that as well, how will you know that you've been heard to them tonight? So Cezanne, you want to say something? Yeah. Um, Does it work? Yeah, okay. So I, I'm also part of ASB at Pali, and I think, I, I don't know, I've attended a lot of meetings and a lot of different conversations with people who are titles in this community. <laughs> and I, I think people will sit and I think people will listen. And I think they're willing to do that. And I think they're interested, which is great, which is kind of expected, hopefully. Um, I just think that as a student, there's a bit of a disconnect. Uh, like, we don't know what is happening. I didn't know what the homework policy was. And I'm literally on student government. <laughs> Um, and we recently, uh, we uh, submit a whole summary of the homework policy to the students so that they knew, but the thing is we don't know what's going on. So if the adults are making these huge changes that really do affect many aspects of our lives, we don't know what's happening, which is crazy to me. And I think um, something that could help with that, other than just basic communication, um, is also surveys and reaching out to students that don't have like limited characters <laughs> inviting students to things like this um, and more accessible and ways of speaking to students but really like targeting communication with students and the board and students and parents and parents and the board uh, but just like communication in general uh, i think that could really help bring our community together but also fix the fact that we don't know what's going on and what decisions are being made about us, which I think is kind of crazy. Charles and then 
Jessica. Oh, Mark. So go that way. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm a senior at Pali, and all my four years I've never had a chance to speak out on something like this. So I was thinking, you know, maybe um, I might as well try this. I want to thank uh, Sally Beavis. I don't know if she's still here. Um, here she is. She's uh, an advisor for a uh, youth group I'm involved with, Click PA, and she requested or she suggested I come over to speak, and I thought that was a great idea. Um, but you know, I was really inspired by everything everyone had to say today, and I did want to add on one thing real quick um, on the topic of suicide. And I know maybe you know, from being from Pali, and you know, I didn't really know the kids too well. Um, that it might seem like I'm, an, I'm like an outsider, but I, I really like that we're inspiring discussion, um, and through the conversations I have with my friends we kind of feel like, you know, suicide is really, it's more of a cultural issue. Um, and I, I feel like at Pali and, and Gun, just, you know, Palo Alto, um, tracks have kind of been synonymous with, you know, suicides and trains, and, you know, it's all the symbolism. And there's this idea that there's precedent in suicides that because someone's done it in the past, and that's like a surefire way um, to get your, your name known, to get, you know, to mean something, that maybe that's a, you know, a stimulant for, for future suicides, and there's, I don't know how we could go about fixing this, but it's for sure a problem. And another issue is, I, I talked to my brother and sister the day um, one of the recent suicides happened, and they said they heard nothing about it in their middle school classes. Um, so, you know, where they're getting this information, all the middle schoolers who are going to be high schoolers and going to deal with stress, is you know from their, pa their the parents, their friends, um, older siblings, who you know it's going to become like a rumor, it's going to be skewed, and all these you know misconceptions about suicide become a cultural issue. It's I don't know how to fix it, but it's just it's just what I've been noticing. Yeah, thank you. So I just wanted to say thanks to all the people that came out. I was expecting more kids to come, but that's okay too. I I normally don't come to stuff like this, and I didn't hear about it. I only heard about it from my mom. So I wish that the stuff that happens in the city of Palo Alto was more exposed to students. Like, I'm in Boy Scouts, and the only reason I've ever gone to see a Palo Alto like meeting is for like a requirement. So I just <laughs> wish there was other ways I could learn about the information than having to go to like meetings. Like maybe it was like given to the students in a way that maybe it's even required for them, but not necessarily like just more open. Like, I wish it wasn't so much of a secret. And I think that would just get the students more involved in the community, that would be great. But I think this is like a great step that like all the students can be involved. And it's just like better at unifying our community. So Becky asked how we would know that we'd been heard. And so on that, I'd like to say on the back of my physics teacher's classroom, where he can see it as he's teaching, there's, a, there's text that reads, have you connected with a student today? Mm -hmm. And I really like that because I think that's one of the important, really important parts of, of our school that we need to emphasize more. So even when we're advocating policy changes and how, ways to, to concretely change how, we, how much homework we have or something like that, we should keep in mind that there's this other side to what to changing the culture as well. And so, when I I'll know that I've been heard when, when you guys out there, especially you names out there, st talk to students and not not about not necessarily about policy or about changes that they'd like to see in the school, but just talk about how their day is going and show that there's some sort of human connection so that it doesn't just seem like administration telling us to do things, administration being this like nameless, formless blob up there. Yeah. So um, I know I've been hurt because, um, because um, a, lot of, a lot of their um, role space on the schools I found the adults and I feel like sometimes we want to say something, we want to speak out, but the annoying thing is, sometimes we're being silenced by the adults and they don't want to hear it from us. So I thought, this is a great thing because I want to speak out and I want to speak out so that everyone can just feel a little bit more comfort comfortable and have the adults 
to understand what we're trying to say to them, so we don't have to be silenced by them anymore. They think they're over. They think they're kind of. They think they they can do changes, but if they do changes and the and they are already silent students, then how are we supposed to know that the students like it if we already silence them? So I like this board because. I want to speak out for the students and have the adults to hear what we want to say and have them to reconsider the new rules. Thank you. Thank you. I, I um, a lot of you spoke about connection. Um, Lynette, Roberto, Kevin, Serena, Jessica, Charles, all of you have talked about friends and connections um, all year long. Tiffany mentioned that um, instead of just a simple week. And one of the follow-up questions that I had for the panel, if we've had time, was can you think of a time where you experienced a strong connection with adults, and with youth and adults? And where was that? What was going on? Is anybody? Cezanne? Sorry. Describe that for us. You know who who were they? You know what was it at school? Was it in the community? Was it in a faith group? Hi. Um, sorry, I'm talking a lot tonight. <laughs> I actually I'm really glad you gave me an excuse to talk about this. So there's a program at my school that Mr. Boone knows about. Um, I don't know what the name of it is officially because there have been a couple names: Camp Unity, Camp Every Town. Um, it's a really great program. Uh, so. A select number of students, I don't know if Gunn does it, but a select number of students from Pali, yes, Gunn does, um, sign up uh, and apply, and you are tipped off to, I think, the hills of Santa Cruz, and you don't really know what's going on, it's kind of strange, you don't, you, it's mysterious, and you get there, and it's about, mm, I'd say, 30 people, and it was one of the most, like, grounding experiences that I've had at uh, Pali, and in my life. Um, I felt like a real connection with all of the students there and um, all of the staff there. And I feel like before that, I didn't really know if there were staff members at Pali that, or like a abundance of them that genuinely cared. And after I was able to come back and I knew for a fact. Um, and everyone cried. That's what everyone says after they get back. Um, and it sounds pretty touchy-feely. <laughs> it is. Uh, but you learn so much about people and cultural differences and so many different things and I wish that we could bring that to the campuses because I know that shipping us off for a weekend uh, for a three hour drive is kind of crazy but um, I wish somehow we could bring that program uh, here because it was so valuable and it touched people that I didn't know would be like open to it. Um, and so I, I don't know, we could talk about that in the future, but I think it would be a great idea. Anybody else? Uh, I just want to say that if anything happened, like maybe some hardship going on, what I think is you have family, you have your parents. Like me personally, I think high school is easy for me because make my parents happy, do all at school and have fun. That's it. Like, don't think about other stuff. Keep your head up, always. Like, no matter like what's going on, there are family. That there are people who you love. There are people who love you. So it doesn't matter. Thank you, Kevin. Anybody else? Kind of made a real connection with uh, adults and youth. Well, I think connection with adults happens when you're talking about similar things. When you when you share similar experiences. I know for a fact that when I talk to my parents about the latest ideas, news, like. When we share opinions, when we share what, what we feel about it, we can connect with each other, we can debate, we can argue, we can agree. And it creates a mutual understanding, not just like with me and my parents, but with teachers, with peers, people older than me, people younger than me. When you're able to talk about the similar things, it doesn't matter what opinion you have. If you can talk about something, then you automatically get like, gain a connection with that person. And I think it's one of the most useful things you can have with someone else.
I was gonna say like what Cezanne said, um, Camp Every Town. Um, I went as a sophomore, and um, it was the first year that we went to a, with the school outside of Palo Alto School District. We went to, with um, Independence High School in San Jose, and like their school is like way different than ours. Like they're like, it's like their library is open like twice a week and stuff like that. And so um, it really brought like good discussion between like the teachers and like the students because like we were like hearing like students that were like also Asian and like they were talking about how like they were poor and like how they didn't have anything to eat like you know and like how they didn't like care about school and stuff like that and it just brought so much like good discussion and I think like camp every time should be something that everyone was required to do but um, <laughs> uh, another uh, thing that I feel like I felt like I felt a connection with one of my teachers was um, my sophomore year Miss McDaniel um, in history like I had never like liked history and um, like, I did, like, really bad in, like, the first, like, three tests, and she was, like, she wrote on my test, like, you need to come see me, come to tutorial, and I never came, and then finally she was, like, she wrote me a call slip <laughs> and sent me to her classroom, and then, um, like, I started talking to her, and she was, like, I'm gonna help you, like, you know, you can do it, and she was just, like, really encouraging, and then, like, after that, like, I told my friends to come, and, like, we all started coming, and we like really made a connection with her and like I still go to her and like get help from her like with history or like just like to talk about things like she emails me all the time and she became like my college advisor so she wrote a really good letter of recommend. <laughs> um, but um, yeah it's just it's just like she asked us like how we were doing and she just had a conversation with us so thank you too. We've lost mic. Oh, there it is. Okay, great. Mark. Yeah, so for me, I think I went to camp every time too. I got in the sophomore year, it was great. I got to know the other chemistry teacher, Mr. O'Connell, and that was like awesome because he would wake up in the morning and do like sit ups and pull ups. I never knew. <laughs> like, we talked about guy stuff, and it was just great because you never really think that the teachers are like funny. But they are. <laughs> and, but the greatest was I was in the SLC, the Small Learning Community of Gun Freshman Year. And that was, so we go ice skating, and I was sick. I had like a fever, like really high. So they, my Spanish teacher, who I grew to like later, but I didn't like at the time, Miss Matchett, she told me that I wasn't allowed to go ice skating, which really annoyed me and my friends because we really wanted to just like have a good time. So she made me stay with Mr. Jacobowski, the vice principal. And I thought I was going to be miserable because I didn't want to have to talk to like the vice principal guidance like the entire night because he was sick too. So, <laughs> basically, we just like talked about a bunch of stuff and we got to know each other and it was great and we still talk and it was just it was great to have a teacher that you can talk to, even though he's like the guidance person. We didn't really like, talk about guidance stuff, but it was just great to talk to a person as like a normal person. So, yeah, that's my experience. So, um, I have a history teacher. Um, I know I keep, he's a kind of, I don't know how to really describe him. But sometimes gets my, my classmates name mixed up with another class. And but I still like to talk to him because uh, because I told him everything I did over the summer, like I went around Europe and I told him my adventure and he said that it was really interesting. I even um, sent him an email about the photos I took in the British History Museum or something. And he said that he really liked them. Um, and I have another teacher, um, He's my biology teacher, and um, I remember one day after class, I talked to him, and um, before I knew it, we were talking about um, Yosemite and photography, and I really enjoyed talking to him about it, because he and I kind of shared a common thing, like, we like nature, that kind of thing. I also got to know him a little bit better. I didn't know he was a, he likes to take photography in his free time, so. Yeah. Thank you, Serena. Um, I, yeah. One more. About like a connection. A connection? Yeah. Actually, this 
I don't know, I didn't plan out what I was going to say this time because I just really wanted to say, yeah, shout out to Mr. O'Connell for being awesome. And also to Miss Artiaga, my ninth grade history teacher, yes. for being awesome. And Miss Aniri de Barrios, who still remembers my name, even though I took her Spanish class four years ago. And Mr. Dunlap, who helped me with my speech. And Mr. Dunbar, who does awesome. I'm, I have, there are too many good teachers at Gunn. This is, this is the point that I'm trying to make. They're all, they're all awesome. And shout out to all of them, because they're all awesome. Thank you. So the reason I asked them that question, um, because I think it's important for us to know where those connections happen. And I don't know if you noticed it from where I am, the smiles that were on the faces as you talked about these experiences um, were really very obvious. And I think it's important for all of us to hear where do those things happen. Um, there are two uh, questions I wanted. We only have a few, a little bit of time here, but there were some, two really good questions. Um, one I want to read directly. It's, most of us as adults did not grow up with social media. What are your recommendations for guidelines of safe and supportive communications <coughs> for people on these sites, especially when pain or suicidal thoughts are shared? And I know that's a very big question, and we don't have a, a tremendous amount of time, but the issue of social media and um, what your recommendations might be. Anybody want to take that? I'm going to go with Lynette first. Um, just to go off of that, actually, Facebook recently did a thing where um, there's a, if anyone posts something that's either with suicidal thoughts or a friend is concerned, um, you are able through Facebook to uh, mark that post and just uh, the person who posted it will get an anonymous message saying, oh hey, there's a friend who's concerned about you and it'll direct you to links that will tell you either like here's some great ways or like here's some people you can talk to for support or things like that. And there's also just great tips and things like that just to help you get through whatever you're thinking and things like that. To bring Anybody light else want to talk about that? Update and then Charles. Well, I mean, I think I don't see very much cyberbullying or, you know, negative social media as a fact. I mean, I I'm, I, I use social media, I'm not a very big fan of it, I, I try to stay away from it, but um, for those who do find you know, the negative stuff in social media, like she said, Facebook is now doing that. I think um, one of the best solutions to it is just to be supportive, stand up for them, because I mean, in real life, if you see someone you know, getting shouted, at, shouted down by someone else, being bullied, you can stand up for them. It doesn't exactly, but I mean, you don't, most people don't really have the nerve to do that, or like the um, you know the witty retorts. I don't, for one. Um, but on social media, if you're if you stand up, it doesn't actually go unnoticed. I feel that if you stand up on social media, people will notice. People will say, "Yes, I agree. Don't don't do this. Don't." And I mean, social media, if used right, can become just as supportive of the community as real life is. And I think that's what I want to say. Thank you. Um, so on the topic of you know dealing with uh, sensitive issues like depression and suicide and bullying over social media, uh, I feel like social media definitely is a place where everyone has a presence. And if you're not speaking up about that, you know it's like, are you uh, apathetic to the issue? Do you not care about the issue? And there really is this idea that you know you kind of have to. I guess if someone doesn't really have an opinion on the issue, they kind of bandwagon on, like, you know, with the, I, I don't know if you guys know, but a lot of Facebook, um, on Facebook, a lot of high school students, you have changed their profile picture to, you know, we're all in this together to, you know, show support for um, depression and suicidal um, issues. Um, and I just feel like there's this, I guess there's a stigma that you, you have to be, you know, caring. And if you're not, you know, in, the, in this discussion, you have to kind of find a way to get into it. And maybe that creates a kind of a, a feeling of, um, I guess, less uh, authenticity in the response of um, how people react to these kind of issues. And another thing is that, you know, when, when these tragic issues do happen, people want to voice their opinions. Um, people try to, you know, um, express, you know, thoughts for people who, have, who are deceased. And sometimes that could be an issue because it could or over glorify uh, you know, the, the, the event, um, and that could lead to, you know, future suicides or future depression. Um, and yeah, that's what I want to say. Great. And I think this is going to be our last, I think because of time, Serena's going to be our last slide.
Um, about social media, I'm like uh, mainly hooked onto my art website, but uh, but um, I feel like um, if you on, if you are online, like your digital self, um, even people still express their emotions for someone else on there, like uh, like about the suicide. Um, and the next day, um, I heard from one of my friends on that website that one of their favorite G model but as a game slash so YouTuber has passed away from leukemia. And I never heard of that person. But when I went to his profile page, I saw a lot of comments about him saying rest in peace. So I was very moved by that. And I just went along with it. Well I want this, my point is that no matter if you're digi if you're online or somewhere, even some words can move you. And you can it's so complicated to explain all of this. Like, Everyone can just go along with the flow, just sometimes just by words itself. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I, I, we're at the end of the student portion, and I just want uh, to say my personal thanks and to all of you for spending time with me um, by phone, by in person, and for participating. It, it was a pleasure for me in a very big way. And I hope that you will also uh, share your appreciation right now for all these young people who felt Uh, who is going to finish with closing remarks. Thank you, Ken. Uh, good evening. My name is Ken Dauber. I'm a member of the Palo Alto School Board, although I'm not speaking as a member of the board. Um, but speaking for myself, and I, I think for many of you, um, I want to say that I couldn't be more proud and impressed and also challenged um, by the words and, and thoughts of the young people who have spoken to us tonight, both on the panel, um, and from the audience. You really shared from the heart and um, you gave us an opportunity to listen and we really appreciate that. That's a real gift, thank you. Um, I heard a lot of things and I, I'm not gonna try to summarize them all, although I'll mention a few of them. I mean, one of the things that I heard is that um, students want to um, hear from us um, about uh, that we're listening in concrete ways. What are we doing with um, the words that you're, um, uh, um, with your experiences. Um, I heard from, um, I heard that you didn't understand, that, that uh, students don't understand about the homework policy, right, even though it's a fundamental part of your life. We obviously need to do a better job of communication. Um, I heard that there's many awesome teachers at Pally and Gunn, which I knew, but I really appreciate um, hearing that, and I appreciate the community hearing that. Um, I heard about the difference um, between uh, comprehension and completion, which I think is a really important distinction to make, that we want schools um, where comprehension is prized over compliance and completion. And I mean, I've heard our principals talk about that as well. Um, in details, things like the importance of not determining um, students' futures in mathematics in sixth grade, in um, not telling a 15-year-old 15, 15 future self in sixth grade about where they're going to be. Um, I know that I've heard those things and many other things. I know that the adults in the audience have heard those things. Um, the people that you've described as names and also others. Uh, and we will take those things and we will do things with them. My job now, and I think our job, um, is to turn those ideas into action that will benefit our youth. Um, I'll be doing that and I'm sure that many of us will be doing that. I do want to take a minute to uh, recognize and thank those community uh, leaders um, who are with us today. Um, our superintendent, Max McGee, who I think is, um, you know, has done a tremendous job and, and, um, uh, is so committed to our community and to our students and his presence here speaks to that. Our principals, uh, Denise Herman from Gunn, and I know that I spoke, um, 
spoke with Kim Diorio at Pali, um, who is at Pali tonight with many teachers in our doing our WASC accreditation. So she's not here tonight because she's doing another thing with our students, um, and that is so appreciated. Um, oh, I'm supposed to ask Max to come up too. So Max, come up. <laughs> Sometimes I follow orders. Sometimes I need to be told the same thing twice. <laughs> so Max, um, we just wanted you to say a word or two about what you've heard and students. Just... Good, let's start that two minute drill here. It's all boo as a side. Uh, I am the luckiest man in the world because I get to work with uh, these young people. Tiffany, I think you were one of the first people I met here and this young man served pancakes at the race on one day. Uh, yeah, I remember that. And. Uh, and, uh, but I'm also one of the luckiest guys in the world because I get to work with the amazing adults in this room, members of the school board, the community, the, the, the staff. And uh, speaking for the adults, we want to be worthy of you. And uh, I've always said that uh, the lessons, uh, one of the most important lessons I learned and what I live by is seek first to understand and then be understood. Uh, that's from Stephen Covey. I think that that's uh, good advice for all of us. And I never walked away uh, but it's without learning uh, something. And so uh, to end on kind of a light note, I, uh, I didn't know you were a football player, Kevin. Uh, I enjoyed, uh, I was at the first game, the Sequoia game, one of the three that you won. And uh, it, it was, uh, <laughs> it was uh, pretty amazing. Now, and it wasn't harsh at all, it was a great team thing. And I, I, uh, but, but I had never heard that I believe cheer about, you know, I believe, and it's a, it's a kind of call and response. And I guess I hope that we can leave here with that same kind of feeling, I believe, right? I believe that we can win. And what does victory look like? Victory is not a, a win or a loss. Victory is empowering, in the words of our mission statement, every single one of our, our, our current and future students to reach their fullest intellectual, creative, and social potential. And if you think their potential is here, just walk outside and look up. That's how limitless their potential is. Thank you all for coming tonight, and thank you, Ken, for this opportunity. So, great superintendent, great students. Uh, you know, I think that's right. We have no no limits. Um, and I also want to recognize the presence of school board members um, Terry Godfrey and Melissa Caswell. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Corey Wolbach, who I sat with uh, in the back, I, Karen Holman was here, although I think our mayor had to go to another event. Um, and I think you can take the presence of all of these folks um, as a sign that we really are listening and we really are committed to, um, to positive change on your behalf and working with you to do that. Um, so I'd like just to give one more round of applause to our youth speakers, if we can. Um, I want to thank uh, Becky Beacom, who did a tremendous job. <laughs> Pat Burt for doing the hard part of the <laughs> introducing um, and letting me come in this part. And I also want to thank the committee members who organized this. So if you're one of the organizers, uh, please uh, stand up and um, talk about it. And I especially want to thank Barbara Sloan um, for securing this space and kind of serving as the initial spark for much of this, and First Congregational for hosting us in this terrific space. Yeah. And thanks also to the Palo Alto Weekly for its generous donation of advertising to let you all know about this event. <laughs> and for making a video that will be posted on the site so that others in our community will have a chance to participate even if they couldn't be here. And finally, thanks again to our many sponsors, and please stop by their tables. Um, they've got lots of interesting information. They're out there working on behalf of um, youth in the community every day, and um, they have much to share with us. Um, finally, two more things. Uh, some of you, actually one of you, but uh, have asked me about this button, um, which is uh, Measure A. Uh, you may not know it yet, but on our May 5th ballot is a renewal of our parcel tax, which is a uh, critical part of funding for our schools. 
Um, and so when you start to see signs and buttons around for Measure 8, that's what it's about. It's a mail-in ballot. It's uh, May 5th. I hope you'll all come out in support of Measure A. It's a critical uh, support for our schools. And um, there's, we can have a round of applause. Even though, even, though even though we're talking about taxes, we're really talking about our kids. Um, and finally, I want to mention that the city of Palo Alto, and I know that several have mentioned this, but I want to underline it, is having a youth forum on March 27th at Mitchell Park. Um, and uh, if you're interested in attending or participating in that forum, um, please contact Kamal Aziz, um, who uh, works for the city. Uh, and that is going to be another terrific opportunity to hear from youth and to follow up on many of the themes that we've heard about tonight. So thank you and good night. I so appreciate your being here.